Are you looking for a drive solution that is infinitely more rigid than a GT2 belt and completely backlash free? Well, this is it. It's not often that we get something in the 3D printing space that you could consider revolutionary, but this is the closest thing to it. Because the Magneto X is jumping straight to linear motors, where each axis is essentially pushing itself forward off its linear rail, kind of like a maglev train. It's also got closed loop control, so theoretically this machine can run itself a lot harder than a typical stepper motor machine, because it doesn't have to keep any safety margins around. But this is also a first generation product. Linear motors are nothing new, but using them for a 3D printer kind of is. So after months of delays, we can finally take a look at the PO Poly Magneto X, right after a message from today's sponsor. If you need machined parts but aren't buying tens of thousands each month, then it can be quite hard to even get a machine shop to talk to you. And if they do, your quote is going to be pretty expensive. But this is something that JSC 3DP is solving. In addition to their on-demand 3D printing service that I featured before, they've now got a super straightforward system for ordering CNC machine parts as well, even if you just need a one-off design. You can get aluminum, brass, copper, and various plastics turned or milled to order, including 5-axis parts. And of course, they don't just scratch out a part that looks like your drawing or step file. You can also specify tolerances, roughnesses, threads, or any other special attention areas on your part. Standard lead time is just 3 days plus shipping, and they'll even do finishing for you, including anodizing, bead blasting, or polishing, as well as laser marking and silk screen printing to your specifications. Check out what JLC 3DP can do for you, and sign up to get $60 worth of coupons at the link below. The last video I did here was about trying the simplest, cheapest printer there is that you can build with today's tech. But this one is all about pushing beyond what we can do today. And I think it's actually the first time we're seeing linear motors like this on a machine that is attainable to normal people. But unfortunately, it's also pushing the limits of what my tiny studio can do. So I had to get a bit creative when unboxing it. That is quite the beefy toolhead, but it is looking like we lost the part cooling fan. According to the specs, this extruder hotting combo will match or exceed anything that I've tested on this channel yet. The entire frame of this printer is massive. The extrusions use really beefy wall thicknesses, uh, but it still looks super clean and super airy because there's no motors, there's no belts, there's nothing like that going on. It's just straight extrusions, linear axes, that's it. PLA CF. So carbon fiber filament out of the box. They've got Lancer PLA carbon fiber and the entire tool head is also called the Lancer tool head. It's a cool name, I guess. All right, so accessories wise, you get a full spare hot end. What is that? Why does it have a filament guide all the way up top? Oh, and oh, wow. Okay, so we're getting dual zone heaters. So there's one heating zone up top, sort of like a, a preheat and then another heating zone at the bottom. This washer at the bottom here doesn't look too great. That's cool. I don't know how they're controlling that, but yeah, this isn't something that I've seen anywhere in a 3D printer yet. Teflon tubes, filament hole. Oh, this looks straight out of an Endo 3. Couple tools. I'm still missing the fan. That hopefully hasn't gone lost in the package here somehow. And then there's one more thing in here, which is the touchscreen. So you get a seven inch the standard HDMI uh, and USB touchscreen with a little dial. Is that brightness? That, that feels very good. It's just basically a tablet screen. How did they get that in there? So, wow. This, if I can get it out, this is the build area. That's actually, I mean, yeah, the printer is big, but that is quite big for the size of printer that you have. You know, if this is the actual full print envelope, then they're making very good use of the, you know, of the volume you're using. So PI on one side and then, that's interesting, it's not fully textured, but yeah, sticker film, just a cool pattern. Then a couple of shock absorber springs. What are these for? And then, oh, oh, I see, I see. Okay, so the entire, ooh, there's a cable here that looks like a Wi-Fi antenna. You don't want to yank on that. This bed alone weighs more than some other entire 3D printers. Now, chicken and egg problem. Gotta get this out. There we go. That weighs as much as an entire Endo 3. I'm not kidding. And it also looks like we found the fan that we were missing. Um, it's just a little fan rotor. But this should just pop right back on. Yeah, there you go. 
open. But yeah, that there is nothing holding this in place. Last couple of zip ties and then this thing should be... Well, we, we gotta mount the bed somehow. These channels are essentially just keeping the axes uh, in place. Uh, can you come out? Thank you. Oh, this stuff is extremely magnetic. What are you for? Oh, okay, right. That's where the bed goes. It goes into these eyes that have these, you know, tolerance adjustment bushings in there. This quick start guide doesn't really help. Having two people to lift and position the printer. Yeah, we, we didn't lift it, so that's good. These all look like they're roughly the, the right height. I think that's gonna be good enough like that. So this essentially rotates up. Into a bit stuck on the cable here. Why is this so short? Does this go lengthwise? Nah. So you're supposed to rotate it 45 degrees, and then I guess you rotate it another 45 degrees. Oh yeah, and then the cable is long enough. All right, so that goes here, that goes there. And then the other two just fall into place. Cool. Oh, there's two buttons on the machine. And then we grab the stacks of a screw, a washer, a spacer, and the spring. Do not tighten in the screws. Okay, so you first get them all started and then you tighten them down. Okay, so I guess the springs on the bottom just make sure that if one of the sides is a bit lower, it, it allows it to sort of spring up in that corner. It's not like on the typical Endo 3 beds where the bed is actually held up with the springs. This literally just allows the bed to pull up just a bit. This corner here has a webcam. It's right there, right in the front. So this actually has a landscape view of the entire print envelope. Does this like... Nope. No. I'm still a bit confused about the entire printer layout because I always thought this side was going to be the front, but that's actually the front of the machine. But that's also why the screen goes here. That's weird. This way around. And then we just plug in our USB and our little mini HDMI. And then the Wi-Fi antenna goes... There. Good enough. It's gonna be tricky to enclose the top side of the machine because, well, you, you have the huge tool head here. The front has these magnets embedded. Sides also have those same magnet spots. So I, I'm guessing that is for some sort of enclosure that you can just plop in here. Right, so... On this entire motion system, you will have noticed that there are no motors and belts. That's the entire point of this thing. On the website, you can actually see the magnets sort of stacked up underneath this shield. Uh, this literally, I think, is just a, a steel strip that has the magnetism going through it. There we go. Oh, wow. So this essentially is one step if you want to say. So each of these magnets are flipped in the opposite direction. So one has north facing up, the other one has uh, north facing down and south up. Uh, so essentially you have a, a magnetic coil or three magnetic coils uh, in the tool head that push off of that, that field that the magnets generate versus uh, the coils generate. And this is essentially just, just a dust shield to make sure that you don't get metal shavings and stuff in there. That looks quite coarse. Um, if this was a stepper motor, then this would have a step size of 10 millimeters or something. But because this is a closed loop system and this entire setup knows where it's at positionally, I don't know where it's measuring that, but it doesn't matter how coarse the actual motor is. All that matters is that, you know, it can push itself into the correct position. So back here, this strip, I think, yeah, this is, I think, gonna be the encoder for the entire thing that gets read out. So the top side, the magnet drive, that pushes the tool head and the x-axis in this case, that pushes that around and then it reads where it's at with the encoder strip and corrects for any positional offsets. Yeah, there's only one motor going in the X direction, it looks like it should be the Y. That feels very good, like I, I don't see any reason why that would not be enough. Also, this is a quite the, quite the massive aluminum part holding everything together underneath this printed shield. So yeah, you can, you can feel there is quite a bit of heft in this entire setup. This is printed a printed shroud and then you have more aluminum blocks underneath. So it's quite the beefer. Right, it's a new day. A couple of things I figured out. First of all, this hot end is actually one that has an even longer melt on it. It uses the same type of nozzle, but it has more unthreaded area right there. So that's the standard sort of long melt zone and then you get an ultra long melt zone one included as well. Another thing that I've sort of had a look at is the underside of the machine. 
I'm hoping I'm not crushing anything, except for my fingers. This is pretty wild. So there's two power supplies uh, that you can see down here. Um, both of these are set to 230 volts, which is fine, but like they should have active PFC, that's a different thing. But this is interesting because this is a earth leakage breaker, pretty much open and exposed. And there's like live 230 volt wiring here where you can reach in. I don't really like this being open like this. This should have some sort of extra cover plate over it. You shouldn't be able to just reach in here underneath, especially, you know, these here, these are also almost exposed. The other 230 volt part is the bed. Um, this entire thing is, as it says right there, 220 volt, 230 volts. And this, just has that thin layer of silk screen where 230 volts is going to be underneath. This all doesn't look like it's super insulated. These wires are not double insulated that go up to the bed. This really should have more insulation against 220 volts. To be honest, this really isn't quite up to the standard that would make it uh, legal to sell on the European market, for example. That's something that uh, Pio Poly will definitely still have to work on um, to make it properly safe. Let's have a quick look inside the bottom electronics compartment because this seems to have a rather standard electronics in here. Right, so that's where all the magic is happening. Wow, that's a lot of stuff going on here. Comes with a free goose feather, it looks like. I don't know how that ended up in here. So there's a Raspberry Pi in here with a clipper adapter V1.0 board. There's another STM32. There's a separate ESP32 module there which I think really only does like RS-485 communication with the brushless motor drivers. And then you have this massive main board here that does all the uh, real-time control, as you would expect from a typical 3D printer. That is a big TreeTech Octopus Pro for TMC 2209s for the 4Z axis motors. And then you have two little adapters uh, that take the step direction and take it over to these two boards, which are the brushless DC drivers. So these look somewhat custom, they're, they're, they're coded, so I'm, I think these might be off the shelf parts. But there's two of these, and these run the linear motors on uh, the X and Y axes. And I think these also handle all the closed loop stuff, um, feedback and stuff. This cable's just loose, okay. I think I'm just gonna plug it in. Feels about right. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be there. Lots of high voltage stuff here. So that's a, a solid state relay that's handling the bed, I would assume, um, just controlled by the main board. Um, there's a custom adapter board that goes into these connectors on the octopus board. Uh, so those are all handled through a PCB, which is kind of cool, save some wiring. But overall, just tons and tons of stuff going on here. It looks like the plate covering all this up is squishing these cables quite a bit. Um, you know, this looks rather tight and squished, especially since the sleeving is already cut through. Let's get this covered back up and see what the printer does when we turn it on. At the very least, I know which parts I better not touch while it's running, which is like the entire underbelly of the machine or the bed. Now, the cool thing is with the linear motor drivers sort of being implemented as a add-on board that just take the step and direction signal off of the main main board, there shouldn't really be anything that's like electrically firmware wise special about driving these and as far as I understand the firmware doesn't really know about the fact that this is running linear motors uh, instead of just stepper drivers or, or DC motors at all instead of stepper drivers. So I guess before we power this up I should install the uh, the PI bed because I don't actually want to run the tool head into this magnetic surface that's gonna mar it up. Yeah they do have alignment pins which is fantastic. Three, two, one. It's doing stuff. So are these drivers already? Oh yeah, they're already alive. So these are, wow. They... But they do let go if you overload them, but these are held in place really well. So down here, you actually have a status LED for both driver units. I think that's what this is. And the right one, as far as I read correctly in the wiki, the right one turns them on and the left one turns them off. So you hold this and now the tool is unlocked or you hold the other one and then it locks back up. There's quite a bit of noise coming off of these. So according to the manual, the first step is to actually do the gantry leveling because this has four independent Z-axis motors just to get the, the bed level. So that's in homing quad gantry level. Oh, the head's moving. 
you can actually hear it go over, going over each individual magnet. That's kind of cool. It's doing sort of a, a wavering sound. Heating the bed, okay. You can get it to make interesting noises by just pushing on the axis. It's, it's sort of squeaking like a, a very quiet duck. And that's just the motors trying to get back to the position they're supposed to be at uh, and correcting essentially for the error that is introduced by me pushing on it. Complete heating and start executing. Oh, wow, you can feel the printer shake. So I guess it does have some sort of a load cell or something in the tool head. Yep. So it did its first round of adjustment. Now it looks like it's readjusting. That motor just skipped. And this ended up putting me on a bit of a squirrel chase. Stepper motors don't like having any sort of axial load applied to their shaft, like having to support the weight of the heated bed. And Pew Poly had the right idea of adding a little support shim and an axial bearing that takes all that weight off the motor. But they didn't actually allow for any clearance between the rotating motor shaft and that spacer, which is supposed to stay still. And as a result, the motor shaft ended up grabbing that spacer and spinning it around, which caused the stepper motor to lose some steps and the quad gantry leveling to never complete. Thankfully, this is a rather easy fix once you know what you're looking for. All it took was drilling out the hole from 5 to 5.5 millimeters, and we were all good. Okay, that sounded a whole lot better. So let's do mesh bed leveling. Okay, it looks like that worked. That's pretty good. That's within two tenths, roughly. On this, that's pretty flat, actually. So we do actually have a couple of pre-sliced prints here. We have a 28 minute benchy. That looks good. We are supposed to disable the runout sensor because that's still bugged currently. I've got the, uh, the spool mount attached to the printer here and the PTFE tube that goes in the printer head. But I'm wondering why they're not doing a full reverse bone. Because as is with this, like the distance between these two is still constantly changing. And that means the printer head is going to yank on the filament as this moves away. I'm going to assemble it according to the manual first. You know, PO Poly were very keen on me not trying any weirdness before it's actually printing. Let me press the load button here. Load. Oh, you still have to manually heat it. That extruder is very quiet. Oh, but there's stuff coming out. There it is, baby's first extrusion. Let's go ahead and print that benchy. Print that benchy. Print that benchy. It looks like it's priming. Yeah, that's pretty fast. It's interesting because it doesn't actually sound like any stepper motor printer I've heard so far. It doesn't have that, that step noise. You can sort of hear some oscillations as it's moving between the individual magnets, but there's no real step sound per se. The fans are very noisy that they're overpowering everything anyway, but like... It's interesting. But for the most part, it, it really just sounds like a 3D printer, you know? And there we go. That actually looks like a really good print. And you know what? I've, I've already grabbed a, a reference bench here. This may just be the first Benji that I'm seeing that does not have this Benji hull line at all, like where it transitions from the from the solid deck material to the, well, more sparse bow, thinner material. This does not have that at all. Like there is literally no hull line. Looks really clean. There is a bit of a, an issue with uh, pressure advance or whatever, uh, where the top infill isn't completely filling in, but this has got to be like one of the cleanest benches I've ever seen. The, the carbon fiber PLA helps. Uh, there is some ringing right there. I guess input shaping isn't quite fully tuned in yet on this machine. And there's also a bit of a, of a patterning going on, almost like a, a delta pattern, but not quite. Um, also a bit of warbliness back here, but overall details are crisp. And this is, this is on a very high level overall. So that turned out pretty well. Uh, but of course, I still want to print my own files on this machine. I still want to slice my own stuff. But of course, with no USB or SD card slot uh, exposed to the user on this machine, and I guess meant to be used as a file transfer, the only options you have is through the network. Um, of course, with this having a Raspberry Pi, there's Wi-Fi built in, there's Ethernet built in. 
I did try to connect it to the 3D printer Wi-Fi that I have set up here, but it doesn't seem to pick it up. I don't know if that is a, a regional thing, a channel thing or something. Um, I've never had that issue before where the printer just doesn't see the Wi-Fi, but I just plugged it in through Ethernet and that worked just fine. As a slicer, Pure Poly are providing a custom build of Orca Slicer, which is based on Bamboo Studio, which is based on Prusa Slicer, which is based on SlickVR. Open source is pretty cool when it works. And it's just got the Magneto X as a pre-configured profile. You get a couple different printing profiles that you can select from, starting from the 0.16 millimeter layer height optimal up to 0.28 extra draft. I ended up going for the 0.2 millimeter standard profile and I enabled supports for this. And yeah, this is looking good. This is gonna be a four and a half, five hour print. And this should really allow the printer to stretch its legs. So of course, Orca Slicer does have the network interface management built right in. And you can see the webcam, that should be live if I put my finger in front of it. Yeah, you can see it's not quite 30 FPS, but it's still more than good enough to get a good view of your machine. And there's our job. Let's go ahead and print this. Shit, 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 shit. That's... That's bad. Uh, I I misclicked. I tried to get the bed down so I could take the uh, the PI sheet off, but apparently there's no software end stops, and the printer will just run the bed into the nozzle. Ah, uh, this looks bent. Ah oh, man. Okay, let me let me get this back up, and see if we can actually uh, still use that hot end. Uh, oh, that's a that's a proper dent. Okay, that might flex back into position. It doesn't look that bad when it's not jammed in there. I think I'm just gonna try using this as is. And this little dent shouldn't be an issue. Oh man, why are there no software end stops in this? Before we start dissecting the print quality that I got here, let me just preface this by saying that I am incredibly impressed by what Pew Poly managed to deliver in a first generation product, really. Um, because the linear motor system works. It totally works. Uh, a closed loop system works. It has no reliability issues. Print quality on the printer, though, is still something that has, I would say, room for improvement, but it is mostly tuning, right? It is firmware tuning, it is software tuning in the slicer, uh, it is input shaping, pressure advance, that sort of thing that can still be done, you know, through over-the-air updates uh, or just with new slicer profiles. That's something that, you know, isn't really impacting the machine itself. Now, looking at the part that I sliced, it doesn't look great. Like, it printed fast, but it didn't print all too well. There are some clear issues with extruder flow control, um, like where it goes out of these threads. There is some definite under extrusion happening and then smaller top solid surfaces are completely over extruded. There is a, a noticeable ridge there happening. So that's just control over the extrusion system that is not happening all too well yet. Also, I did see that it is dropping down to 5,000 and 10,000 millimeters per second squared acceleration. Uh, which is a lot lower than the 22,000 that was initially promised. That is something that I guess can be unlocked uh, with better tuning of the machine. I didn't run any input shaping or pressure advanced tuning on this yet, um, but of course, since this runs full clipper, that's something you can do. And again, clipper doesn't care about the fact that this is a linear motor system. Now, talking about the linear motors, um, what I am noticing is that there is a very distinct pattern on flat surfaces of the part. And the only real way that I can explain this pattern is due to the control loop of the uh, linear motors, that there's something oscillating, something, you know, just adding a bit of shimmer, a bit of, of ripple to these surfaces that should be perfectly straight. But also, this is something that I think could be ironed out with uh, tuning of the brushless DC drivers and that the control loop that runs on that. Because now you have like three control loops running on top of each other. You've got the motion input itself with accelerations and that sort of thing. 
uh, you've got input shaping, controlling before it gets sent to the drivers, and then the driver and their closed loop system trying to actually execute that in a way that is as true to the desired input as possible. So those three systems really need to work together to achieve a, a common goal, which is to produce a part that just looks good and has no artifact or ripple like this. Um, again, that's something that really is down to software. But like looking at the core of what this printer is, which is really a, a I guess a tech demo for the linear motion system, it works with no real hiccups, right? It's, it's, it's transparent to the entire firmware. The firmware doesn't care that it's linear motors or steppers. And if you didn't know that this was a beltless, stepperless XY motion system, then, you know, you wouldn't actually notice. And again, some of the finer details, like, you know, the 230 volt insulation, um, the fact that the firmware isn't really totally set up yet, that's something I am more willing to forgive this machine than like a, another Ender 3, because this is, again, more of a tech demo, more of a first iteration of something new. And really, I wanna see this tech get more refined and, and more available to more machines. I think it has potential. It's eliminating stepper motors, it's eliminating belts, it's a closed loop system. Those are all things that are very desirable for higher performance 3D printers. The 3D printer that they built around this core system still needs a bit of work, but it is very promising. And again, it's quite impressive for a first gen product. So thank you all for watching. Hope this was interesting for you. It certainly was for me, this sort of stuff, new tech, love it. Uh, if you wanna support these videos, you can check out Patreon or the YouTube membership options. Uh, I would like to say thank you for everyone who is already supporting the channel through those options or just by watching the videos, subscribing, sharing them. Uh, yeah, hope you liked it, keep on making and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye.